Orleans as well. On my part, I went to Pensacola Catholic High School and to junior college and my bachelor's degree at the University of Florida. And I broke family tradition because I went to work for Eglin Air Force Base down the road. Uh, after a few years, I got an opportunity to move to the U.S. Department of Labor in Atlanta, Georgia, where I quickly kind of moved my career into a new, at that time, federal agency, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. I moved around the country a good bit. Uh, and was got my master's degree during that period of time and then got sent to Harvard on a fellowship at the Kennedy School of Government. Went to Washington where they promptly sent me to Chicago as the regional administrator and then on to Atlanta, Georgia as the same job. I ended my career with seven years in Washington as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Labor and Secretary of Labor. I worked several other jobs and came back home to my hometown, Pensacola, which I love, and got involved in my community, in my local HOA, on the board of directors of the public television station, and working with county government. I was on the Mass Transit Advisory Committee, and I was on the Restore Committee as the vice chair. All of those things led me to decide to put myself before you today here as a candidate for the Board of County Commission District 2. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Mr. Trotter. Hello, my name is Scott Trotter. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm originally from Kansas. Uh, I haven't lived there in a long time though because uh, I joined the Air Force back in the early 90s and I spent 20 plus years uh, traveling around the country and around the world in the Air Force working in financial management. Uh, during that time I helped uh, manage a lot of large complex budgets in some ways similar to uh, what we have here in Escambia County and other ways quite different. Uh, I spent much of that time as a budget analyst, and that's a skill that I, I hope to bring to uh, our budget here, or our, our county government. Uh, once I retired, we decided to uh, move down here for a number of reasons. Uh, I wanted to go up to the University of West Florida and get my master's degree in history. I was also attracted to the area because I've spent much of my Air Force career living in the south and along the Gulf Coast, and I knew I liked this area even though we hadn't lived in Pensacola before. And uh, since we've got here, we've really loved it. Um, we ended up buying a little brick house in uh, Warrington that we, we fixed up. And uh, that's that, and take uh, graduate classes up at UWS, what I've been doing the last couple of years since I retired. Uh, I didn't have any thought of running for a county commission. On the 1st of January this year, I had no idea I was going to be doing this. But uh, over the last year or two, I've gotten more and more uh, where I've been following local politics, and I have seen. Uh, disturbing trends that I thought we needed someone to step up and do this and I was in a position where I was able to do it so um, after I saw that there was only one other candidate running I decided to uh, go ahead and throw in my uh, throw into the ring and uh, see what I could do and uh, bring some honest uh, leadership to uh, this county thank you My name is Doug Underhill. I'm your county commissioner. I uh, got elected four years ago to be uh, to represent uh, District 2 in the southwest sector of Perdido. Uh, I'm a Navy brat, so uh, the simplest question that you always ask somebody is where you're from, but for a Navy brat that's a hard question to answer because um, you're a professional new kid. Um, growing up that way, I knew that I would do different for my children, and although I am a 28-year uh, now veteran of the Navy, uh, I made it a point to make sure that my children would never have trouble answering the question, where are you from? And it is with great pride that I get to say that when my children answer that question, where are they from, they're going to say pretty do key. Uh, I have was enlisted for 11 years. Uh, for first Gulf War broke out in 91. Uh, I walked out of uh, college uh, class and right into a recruiter's office, and I was in uniform a week later. I uh, went to Defense Language Institute, learned Arabic, was a counterterrorism, uh, worked in counterterrorism as an enlisted man uh, for 11 years uh, before I met Wendy and uh, she uh, convinced me that uh, I was uh, needed to go ahead and come over to the dark side. Uh, enlisted life is much more fun, but officer life uh, uh, was, uh, was the path. Um, got commissioned right here in, uh, in, at uh, Officer Candidate School on Naval Air Station. Now that was not my first time coming to NAS. I came here in 93 for Air Crew Candidate School, and that's when I got my first bite of the apple at Perdido Key. I drove a, drove a Jeep rank, a, a CJ back then, and got to, back then you could drive it right out onto the beach. Fell in love with the place, saw the rest of the world uh, for the next uh, almost 20 years, 10, 10 or 15 years, and uh, never saw a place that I liked more than this. So we came back here, 
I worked as a counter in counterterrorism up until uh, just a few years ago when I switched over to cyber and then built a cybersecurity team up at uh, Cory Station at DHS. Um, what I bring to you as a county commissioner is exactly what you've seen. You will get the facts. You will get a very clear, concise statement of the, uh, of the mission, the problem, and then put the solutions in front and then act on them. So uh, looking forward to another four years of doing precisely the same thing. talking with my back to you all so um, real quick I just realized I forgot one thing in the announcements and then we'll get into the questions um, were there any um, ele other elected officials who joined us tonight seeing no hands um, yes, yes. elected officials all right so Lois Benson is on the ECUA board thank you for joining us and we also have um, another candidate with us where did he go um, Alex Andrade um, is running for State House District 2, um, so if you're interested in talking to him about that race, um, uh, please do that. So he is here tonight um, as well. So sorry, my apologies for forgetting that. And now we're getting into the questions. All right, so remember we're having 45 seconds and we'll do our best. That's quick. Two minutes was a lot longer with the green, yellow, red. All right, so our first question is going to be about the Perdido area. Um, and we're gonna start, um, like I said, in um, an order based on our opening statement. So we're gonna do, I started with reverse order for this. So we're gonna start with Commissioner Underhill, um, followed by Mr. McMillan and Mr. Trotter. Um, and so our first question, and then just let me know after everyone has answered, if you would like to make a rebuttal statement, you'll get an additional 45 seconds. All right, so our question to Commissioner Underhill first. So what does the Perdido area mean to you, and how important is the Perdido area to District 2 as a whole? Well, uh, really it's a two-word two answer. Um, Perdido area is my home. It has been my home since I moved to the area. Uh, we've lived in a number of houses in the Perdido area, but always in the Perdido area. Um, how important is it to the district? Um, it is it's the driving force economically for the district. Uh, it's also the spiritual home uh, because this is the playground for everybody in the district. Um, the geographic definition, I think if you uh, look at it that way, uh, I look at that as basically everything from Walmart to the south and to the west, that whole southwest sector. For those that were here during the Envision Perdido days, that's kind of what we figured as the, uh, as, as the greater Perdido area. Um, and uh, it's a spiritual place, it's a physical place, uh, and it is also a big economic engine for this county. Thank you. All right, so then, Mr. McMillan. Let me see, is it, yes, it's on. Well, the Padilla area is, in one word, paradise. I grew up here, I sailed boats out to the, uh, to the key when I was a boy. My wife, who came down here with me from up uh, north, fell in love with it, and every day she gets a chance, she walks Johnson Beach and brings all of her friends there. It's also important economically to not just District 2, but to Escambia County, with about 20% of the sales and bed tax all coming out of the Perdido Key area. So it's a critical area, it's vibrant, it's growing, and it's paradise. Five seconds doesn't mean you have to use all the time just as a reminder um, all right so then last one mr. Trotter all right my relationship to uh, Perdido Key is very much different especially different from his and also different from his because I'm not from here I don't live there but when I go out there you know, I think it's just a, it's a wonder of human civilization and nature coexisting uh, it, it's a really a unique place I love going out there and uh, I think Whoever wins this election, our number one thing is to not screw it up. Because uh, it's, a, it's a great place. Anyone like to make a rebuttal or response to the what does Perdido area mean to you question? No? Okay. All right, so the next question is going to be on traffic, safety, and congestion. So we're going to start with Mr. Trotter first, uh, then Commissioner Underhill and Mr. McMillan. All right, so the question to Mr. Trotter, with accidents involving vehicles, cyclists, and pedestrians, a continuing concern and congestion on Sorrento Road, Gulf Beach Highway, and Perdido Key Drive, a frequent problem, what would you do to improve traffic safety and management in the Perdido area? All right, uh, I'm not a traffic 
account, uh, expert, uh, what I would do is I would want you guys to contact me and say, you know, this is what I've seen. I have suggestions. I think this is a dangerous area. I, I, anyone can always come to me and I'll, I'll listen to you even whether you agree with me or not. And I will take your concerns and I will go to the counties, uh, traffic management experts, and we'll see what we can do. I, I'm not an expert on that, so I'm going to go to the experts and we'll look to see what we can do. Thank you. Commissioner Underhill. Thanks a lot. Um, I will continue to do what I've been doing for the last four years, and that is driving the Perdido Key Master Plan, uh, which cr is based around the idea of a bike and ped, bike and pedestrian uh, friendly Perdido Key. Not just for those that live there, but for the day visitor as well. One of the principles of that master plan is we want you to park your car one time and be able to enjoy the amenities of the island for the entire day. So the Perdido Key, you know, and, and you know, it's easy to say these words for 45 seconds, but the reality is putting your money where your mouth is. My number one restore project was the Perdido Key bike path because that is the backbone of that bike, head, safe, friendly uh, Perdido Key. Now, we, once that is built, we get to tie all of our other uh, sidewalks and bike paths into it, enabling you to get around the key without having to turn a key. Thanks. So this is an issue that is dear to me, uh, not just as a candidate, but in my life's work. As, uh, am I okay? No? Okay. As a, as a career OSHA official and the president and CEO of the National Safety Council, traffic safety was one of the biggest issues that we ever dealt with. It's a big issue here. Just driving out here tonight with the congestion on Sorrento Drive and Gulf Beach Highway. We need to four-lane Sorrento Drive, Gulf Beach Highway from Navy Boulevard to the Key Bridge. We need, we need to have bypasses and We need to have good, safe crosswalks. We need turn lanes. And you know what? We may need to review the speed limit on the key. I think it's, uh, people always drive over the speed limit. Safety is primary, and it'll be my goal to make it safe and to deal with traffic congestion. Anyone like to make a follow-up? All right, Commissioner Underhill. And that is precisely why uh, Gulf Beach Highway has been elevated to the number five project in the county and Sorrento Road elevated to the number seven project in Escambia County. Bottom line though is that these things, it doesn't matter how many times you plan it, design it, draw it, talk about it, if you can't put your money there, then those things are not going to be done. We've got to figure out and we've got to put our priorities in the right place and that is to fund these projects first and then all of the special interest projects last or ideally never. Thank you. Mr. Trotter or Mr. And, and I would simply uh, add to, uh, to that that it takes far too long. Government kicks the can down the road. It's time to stop doing that. It's time to get it done. And to get it done, it's going to be working with the state, working with the county, working with the other four commissioners, and get it done. We're going to move on to the next question, which is about law enforcement presence. So the question, so we're going to start with Mr. McMillan, and then Mr. Trotter, and Commissioner Underhill. All right, so the question to Mr. McMillan. Popular tourist areas should have a substantial law enforcement presence to help control speeding and reckless driving, rowdy behavior, and crime. How would you improve the Escambia County Sheriff or other law enforcement presence in the Perdido area? Well, I think the key there is working with the sheriff. I think we have a fine, fine county law enforcement organization. We got to support it. We got to work with them and make sure they got the resources that they need. I've had a chance to meet with our sheriff. I've had a chance to meet with the only candidate that I think is yet declared to be a candidate for the next sheriff. We need to continue to work with them, and we need to work with the condo owners and the business owners so that we educate everybody about rowdiness, drinking behavior and the under, and understanding the acceptable parameters of social conduct. We can do all those things, but the real burden falls on our law enforcement personnel. Our job in county government and on the commission side is to support them. All right, then we're gonna go to Mr. Trotter. All right, I know everyone is always concerned about crime. They want more law enforcement in their area, but there's limited resources. I support the sheriff and, the, and their department in allocating those resources where, they, where they're needed most. 
Um, if, if you have concerns, I will address, I'll go to the sheriff and I'll see what he has to say about it, but ultimately I'm in favor of letting the sheriff run the sheriff's office and um, that, that's basically what I got to say about it. Well, the job of the county commissioner is not only to let the sheriff run the sheriff's office, and I know that's actually very new, that's a, that's a, that's a new idea <laughs> uh, in Escambia County, but it's also to fund the sheriff's office properly. I am the only county commissioner who supported funding the sheriff's budget request in its entirety from the very first day until the last day when we actually did agree to the $9 million plus up that, to the sheriff's budget, which will in fact correct some of the uh, pay disparity issues. These are the folks that we call upon in our darkest moment, and we expect them to show up, and we expect them to show up properly, manned, trained, and equipped to do the job. Bottom line is, though, right now in Escambia County, we're down about 40 deputies from where we need to be. So the $9 million that we have done, that we plussed up his budget with, that solves the sins of the past. Now we need to work on improving for the future. On to question number four, um, which is about schools. We're going to start with Commissioner Underhill, Mr. Trotter, Mr. McMillan, in that order. So Jim C. Bailey Middle School and Escambia High School do not score well by some measures of performance. School choice in the state of Florida allows students to attend other schools in the region, but this can mean an hour or more commute. Ideally, parents and students would choose attendance at Perdido area schools, so what are your plans to improve public education for students in the Perdido area? One of my sons just graduated from Booker T. Washington up by the mall, and my other son, who's here tonight, uh, goes to Pine Forest High School. So we are experiencing this ourselves. Uh, when they were little children uh, next door to us uh, in elementary school, we were told that by the time they went to high school, we'd have a West Side High School. Um, I'll tell you right now, if your children go to school here, um, they're not going to go to school at West Side High School. Uh, this is not uh, in the swim lane of the county commissioners. This is very squarely in the swim lane of the school board. Uh, and it is something that, quite frankly, needs to be addressed. Um, but you have to understand that your county commissioners will not be able to address it. That's your school elected school board officials who are also running for office. And I strongly recommend you consider that during the uh, election process. Mr. Trotter. All right, like Doug said, it's primarily a school board issue. There's a limited amount that the county commission can do to improve schools. Uh, I do want to say that I strongly support improving our public schools and fully funding them by uh, stop sending public dollars to private schools. We need to keep that funding in the public schools. Um, one other thing I just want to say about school ratings. Uh, I think they do serve a purpose. They let you know what's going on in schools, but you can't judge quality of a school by the grade. My kids go to school in Warrington Elementary. It's consistently got D's and F's. I can tell you they've had great teachers there. They've got a good education. The grades tell you more about where the students are coming from and what the students' uh, home lives are like than what the actual quality of the school is. Thank you. Well, it's similar to, I think, uh, all three of us are saying, it's similar to the last uh, question, and that is the, the primary responsibility goes to the elected school board, and in our case, to an elected superintendent. I met with Malcolm Thomas now on several occasions since I became a candidate, and what I pledge to him is that as a county commissioner in District 2, I will be an activist, supporter, and partner of good schools and strong schools. And yes, in some respects, it is our job as county commissioners to help make our schools better. We don't have the direct control and authority, but we can make a difference by getting behind good jobs, good neighborhoods. And if we have those things, we have strong families, schools will improve. I'm going to take advantage of the bully pulpit in a large room full of, uh, of Westsiders to bring up the fact that we know now that we have an elementary school coming to the west side that's going to be built there, ostensibly going to be built on Sorrento Road. The first time that you heard about that publicly was when I posted it on social media. That's not the right way to do government, folks. The school has bought that property. It's inside the AIPD2, which is part of the approach to the base, um, where you cannot do high density uh, development. It is in an area that we already have traffic problems, and it's in an area that has uh, some serious flooding issues. 
That's not the kind of planning ahead that's going to get us the schools that we need. We've got to get to a point where we realize that the time to build collaboration with the people is at the very beginning of the project, not by the time we take it to the planning board. Thank you. on to the next one. All right, so question five is about the Theo Bars Bridge. And we're going to start with Mr. Trotter and then Mr. McMillan and Commissioner Underhill. So the Theo Bars Bridge was built in 1974 and is the only land access to Perdido Key from the rest of Florida. It is dangerous for pedestrians and cyclists to cross and had a cycling fatality on one of its approaches in March of this year. How high a priority will improvement to the Theo Bars Bridge be on your agenda? All right, anticipating this question, I went, I did go out and I found uh, the latest uh, uh, inspection of the bridge and it seems to be structurally sound. So it's probably not gonna get replaced in the near future. It is deficient on some safety issues. Uh, I would be more than uh, willing to talk to our county's uh, uh, experts on that to see if there's any way of retrofitting it. But to a certain degree, probably for the foreseeable future, we're going to be stuck with that bridge. So we can, uh, we can see what we can do about it. But there's going to be a limited amount that we can do to actually improve the situation, I think. So from my perspective, it is a huge project in terms of time and dollars. It's not going to be replaced for a long time. And I think what that does is makes us challenged to think outside the box. Maybe there's another way to help create safety, particularly for bicycles and pedestrians on the bridge. Now, I'm not an engineer, but an idea that someone approached me with was why don't we look at maybe a short, not a short-term fix, an interim fix where we might put a steel cantilevered bike walkway path attached to the bridge outside of the shoulders of the bridge. Maybe that's something that we could get funded and could get done. It's a quick idea off the top of my head. Well, I think we have to think outside the box. What's not acceptable is doing nothing when we got a safety hazard on the bridge for bikes and people. Guys, I'm not going to sell you something that I'm not going to deliver. And uh, that there will not be, it, it is highly improbable, if not impossible, to, uh, to see any changes or improvements to that bridge over the next 10 years. And here's why. We just completed a complete, a, a complete renovation of the bridge uh, two years ago. That was actually done from underneath the bridge so that it did not create any impact on the travelers going over the bridge. Many people who use the bridge every day had no idea that that was going on. They just went through it on, under it on a boat one day and realized, oh, the bridge is blue now. Um, that was, the bridge was completely galvanized and it's going to last for another about 30 years or so. Um, the idea of cantilevering a bike path or walking path off the side of the bridge um, has been addressed a number of times through the, uh, the Citizens Advisory Committee of the TPO and the FDOT staff said, do you really want us to answer that? It's just not anywhere on the agenda. It is not something that is realistically going to happen with FDOT dollars and it's an FDOT bridge. Thank you. Would anyone like to make a rebuttal? No hands or eyes or any indication. All right, so we will move on to our next question, which is number six, dealing with public beach access. So we're going to start with Mr. McMillan and then Commissioner Underhill and then Mr. Trotter. So with limited facilities and parking at the three Escambia County public beach access locations on Perdido Key and with beach access one, the most troubling, what can be done to improve Perdido Key beach access for local residents and visitors while also considering the rights of property owners? Maybe the toughest question on this list to answer in 45 seconds. We have a new law that went to effect on July 1st. We have property rights of people who own the property down to roughly the mean high water line. In the past, maybe those weren't being enforced by the condo owners. They are now more and more. So citizens are finding it difficult to go and use maybe a place that they used before. The law is the law. We have to respect the law. It's going to have a lot of adjudication. We now have a new executive order that the governor just sent out that needs to be evaluated and understood. We are lucky in that we have Johnson Beach, a lot of miles of beautiful beach available to us, and we have three miles of state mark. I'd also like to look at the piece of property we bought in 2013, what's called the Sundown uh, Beach property for $750,000.
That could be beach access, but we'd have to do it with money and protecting the habitat to do so. Commissioner Underhill. So something that's important to know, and this may shock you if you're on social media a lot, the new law that went into effect July 1st and the executive order have the net effect of actually changing nothing for Perdido Key. Not a single thing changes with regard to that. Can't, be, can't answer all that in 45 seconds. But the net effect is what has always been the case on Perdido Key is still the case on Perdido Key today. We have an obligation in the government to provide infrastructure. If you are a coastal community, if you are a waterfront community, part of infrastructure is public access for all to the water. If you are a waterfront property owner as I am and you want to secure your personal property rights going into the future, then the way that we do that is that we protect those access rights for everybody else. We protect our own rights by protecting those same rights in others. Thank you. All right, um, beach access is a very critical thing. We need to expand it as much as possible. I, I'm also curious why that property out west of uh, the state park has been sitting there for since 2013. We haven't done anything with it. Um, I, I think there are some plans to do something with it. Uh, this is critical because we've spent so much time and energy on Pensacola Beach. The number one thing we can do to relieve congestion out there is open up additional beaches other places. For locals to go to. So whether it's on Perito Key or in um, Navy Point or, or uh, the Tanyard, we got there's water all over the place. We need to have more options for local people to go to to get on the beach. Thank you. And then, uh, Mr. McMillan, and then Mr. Yeah, I mean it's just an opportunity to be able to take a little touch more time on this subject. But I do believe that one of the roles of our county commission is to help communicate. Help keep, keep people informed. Try to find ways in which we're going to create solutions. But we are a, a country of laws and a county of laws, and we're going to have to observe what the law is regarding private property ownership. But we really ought to be trying to find ways to get more access into all the magnificent available land, either state park or national seashore that we have. And I think we can probably do a little better there. And we can't do it by ourselves. We have to work with the state. We have to work with the federal government. But we have got a glorious, glorious key here and magnificent beaches. And we want people that live there and people who visit to be able to come and use them. Commissioner Underhill. Thank you. The um, property that's being referred to, the Sundown property, was purchased 75% uh, of it with a Chapter 6 uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Grant, which is a conservation grant. If you try to use a federal grant and you do not meet the criteria in the way that you use the property, you are going to find yourself crossways with the federal government. That would not be beneficial for any of us. By the time you meet the criteria of that grant, there is so little land left for public access that it doesn't make sense to try to use it in that capacity. You're going to end up with yet another tiny access, which has really been the problem on Perdido Key. In addition, Open up your Purdue Key Master Plan, look at page 18. It talks about public access for the non-resident being close to the areas, the built-up areas of the community. That's critical to that walkable, bikeable, enjoy the key without turning a key mentality that is the Purdue Key Master Plan. Thanks. Yeah, the, the land that we've been talking about uh, the, the, that was owned by the Sundown Condominium. One of the reasons why it was bought was public access to the beach. So the reason is that it's, it's been sitting there for what, seven years or five years, something like that. We need a, yeah, it's 200 linear, linear feet of beach that we need to open up. Thank you. All right, so that concludes all of our rebuttals for question six. So we'll move on to question seven, which is dealing with habitat conservation plan. We're going to start with Commissioner Underhill, Mr. Trotter, and then Mr. McMillan. So the question, Perdido area residents are concerned about their environment. Do you support the Perdido Key Habitat Conservation Plan and its goal of protecting the environment while streamlining administrative procedures for developers? Absolutely. The Habitat Conservation Plan is the law on Perdido Key. It is an absolute critical document for understanding Perdido Key. If you don't understand the Habitat Conservation Plan, the Perdido Key Master Plan, and the Destination 2020 document that we created, then most of the discussion about Perdido Key is going to be uh, uh, words only and no action. 
Habitat Conservation Plan is the one tool that we have to ensure that Perdido Key does not get built out like just about every other beach in Florida has into a concrete jungle. I will stand and fight for that Habitat Conservation Plan every single time. I will always oppose any action that is prejudicial to the HCP. All right. Uh, I think the, uh, the Habitat Plan is, is a really good idea. It's working good. I'm, I'm an environmentalist. I think, you know, even if the, the beach mouse wasn't in danger, I'd be all about preserving that habitat. And it does that. I'm also for managed, smart development, and it allows for that. So I think it's a, it's a great plan, and I fully support it. Just one second. Okay. Go ahead. Mr. McBeal. Habitat plan is the law. It's actually a good law. I haven't met anybody who doesn't think this is smart, that we have great coexistence between uh, all the habitat that we're trying to conserve. And it's more than just the beach mouse, it's turtles, it's birds, it's all kinds of things. It's a good law and we need to observe it. There's a fund that's been created to go with that as part of the habitat plan. And I believe that fund now has something close to maybe $700,000 in it. I don't believe any of that money's been used just yet. We want to make sure that when it does start to be used, that there's transparency and inclusion of ideas within the structure of the Habitat Plan on what's the best way to use those funds as we go forward in the future. Like to respond? Thank you very much. Um, one of the critical things to remember about the HCP is the Habitat Conservation Plan allows us to issue permits for construction on the island. Without the HCP, anyone trying to build on the island in beach mouse habitat would have to go through the seven-year process with the federal government. We are able to balance this and we're able to pull permits and develop and move forward as long as we fall within the HCP. A lawsuit against the county under the HCP would result in the almost immediate end to all construction on the island. Trying to build on a property that was built for uh, on the sundown property i can assure you there is already an attorney that has been hired and money has been set aside to sue us under the hcp think about that before you push too far down the road of wanting to build out that parcel so i'll use my remote time to touch on the uh, sundown beach property uh, and there's a lot that i can probably still learn about it and i will learn about it but my thought about it is it would provide beach access. We could do a crosswalk over the habitat like we do in other places and bring it to the beach. It's the beach access. We don't need to be where the habitat is. I think we ought to explore that and I believe we can make that happen at a reasonable cost and increase beach access. Move on to question number eight, which deals with the Perdido Key Master Plan. Um, so we're going to start again with Mr. Trotter and then Mr. McMillan and then Commissioner Underhill. So Mr. Trotter, the Perdido Key Master Plan was overwhelmingly supported by the Perdido Key community and unanimously approved by Escambia County Commissioners in June 2016. It calls for one or more urban centers on the